We were with you on Father's Day, and it's a delight to be with you again today. We're just thrilled to be here. We, uh, we love this church, and I know that you love it, and um, we love uh, your pastor. Aren't you thrilled he's coming back, huh? All right, okay, that's something to look forward to. And uh, we love your heart for outreach here and mission. We also love the music of this church. The music is amazing, isn't it? Good work, good work on that. Thank you so much. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask you to uh, find your Bible, if you would. I, I hope it's not far away. And uh, turn with me to uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is Paul's last will and testament, as we like to say, before his own suffering and sacrifice, before his execution. And uh, 2 Timothy 1, and uh, I'd like to just read our text for today, beginning in verse 7 right down through verse 14, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us, and called us uh, to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. We sang about that this morning. He loved me ere he knew me. We sang that, already sang that this morning, didn't we? Isn't that great? Verse 10, and, and which now he, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Oh, man, what great words. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the testimony of Jesus this morning. We're thankful for the clarity of these verses. It tells us the issue is Jesus And the issue ultimately is the glory of God. Lord, encourage our hearts this morning with your word. Uh, Speak as only you can. By the Holy Spirit, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. A few years ago at the church I served uh, at that time as pastor, we had a, uh, a missions conference. And at this conference, we had a guest speaker from Romania. His name was Joseph Son. And uh, he told about his life in Romania under intense persecution during the communist days there. And uh, he entitled his talk, What It Takes to Be a Missionary. And he said, uh, you know, there's really two things it takes to be a missionary. He said, first of all, you have to be willing to die. Because as a missionary, you're going to tell people that they're wrong. They might not want to hear that they're wrong, and they may kill you in response to that. I'm I'm thinking, I can't wait to hear what's second here. I mean, this first thing sounds a little tough, you know. First of all, you have to be willing to die. Secondly, he said, you have to have a message worth sharing. And I think both of those things are in Paul's mind as he writes these words to Timothy, and now even this morning to us. You must be willing to suffer, and you must have a message that's worth 
sharing. So I think the theme that that Paul is is getting across to us is this. By his great power, God strengthens us to face suffering for the sake of the gospel. This is what it takes to be a missionary. Now, Paul gets right to the issue in verse 8. Now, I want to read verse 8 again. Therefore, he says, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. The word testimony there is, is really the, the, the word from which we get our English word martyr, and it means witness, about the witness for our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Paul is telling us very plainly here. Listen, Timothy, here's what you need to remember. The issue is Jesus. No matter what anyone else says, the issue is always Jesus Christ. People may say, well, I don't like the way you guys worship. I don't like the color of the carpet in your church. No, no, no. no. That's not why they kill Christians. I, I don't like the fact that you guys collect money. No, that's not why they kill Christians. The issue is Jesus, and he wants us to know this. And he, he, he knows also that, that there's a strong temptation to be ashamed out of fear, out of an interest in preserving ourselves. And so Paul knows this is the case. And so he, he uh, you know, if Timothy had not been feeling this temptation to be shy about the gospel, Paul would not have written to him like this. And if, and if Paul himself had not experienced this temptation, he would have not written years before Romans 1.16, for example, that says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, if, if this were not a common, just a very common temptation among God's people, Jesus would not have issued the sharp warning. Listen to this warning from Mark 8 and verse 38. Whoever, Jesus is speaking, he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him Will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels? You know, I think the truth is, and if we look at, as I look at my own heart, you know, we are, we're all probably more sensitive to public opinion than we like to admit. I know that I am. I, I realized this when I was a very young Christian, just a year or two into the faith, and and I began to attend Drake University here in town, and there was, there was a situation where I was, I developed, a, I met a new student, a guy that we kind of connected, and, and I hadn't really said anything. I hadn't meant to hide the fact that I was a Christian, but I hadn't said anything about this to him. And he came to school one, one uh, Monday morning after the week, and he said, hey, he says, I'll tell you something, he said. I, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior this weekend. And, you know, I was happy for him. In fact, I was thrilled for him. I was also ashamed personally that I'd never said anything to him about this myself. I thought, what a loser I am, you know. And so I made, I made a decision right then that within the first five minutes of meeting someone, I will do something to let them know that I'm a Christian. No game playing, no assumptions, no letting a conversation drift into things that I might not be comfortable with or shouldn't be involved in. Five minutes, and you know, that's been a good check for my spirit. It's been a good help to me as I've witnessed. Well, let's, let's review the message here that Paul wants us to know about, and, and it's, a, it's an amazing message, and it, it starts out really in verse 9 with these words, and he, God saved us. He saved us. You know, one of the things that I noticed in all of, this, all of the songs we sang this morning in most of those songs, there's a complete expression of the gospel. D did you catch that? I hope you appreciate that. I hope you take time, talk to members of the band, talk to Steve and Pastor Steve and say, look, thanks for the good work, guys. Well, we need that every song was about the gospel of Christ. What a wonderful thing. And so Paul is saying right away here, God saved us. He saved us. And he wants us to know that that God has initiative in this. Salvation is his idea, not our idea. 
It happens by his power, not by our power. But this is great stuff, isn't it? God saved us. You know, we can talk for days just about those three words. God saved us. I've been uh, reading a book again that, uh, that we use with our summer camps in Romania. And uh, the, this, the summer camps that we have in Romania are about learning English. And we call them English language evangelism camps. So we will take, and, and, and the Romanian people want to learn to, to read and to speak English like Americans. They don't want to learn British English. They want to learn American English. And so we take American teams over there. And one of the things we do is we share some written materials from American. And one of the books I've, I've got here, and I'll introduce the book in a minute. It's a short book, just 70 pages. But we share this book with our advanced class. And uh, it's, it's about a young Muslim teenager growing up in India. And he attend, he's in school. He's about a sophomore. And during his sophomore year, he, he has a teacher, a biology. He was interested in biology because he wanted to become a doctor someday. And this teacher would come, show up at school every day with a large red dot. She was Hindu, a large red dot on her forehead. And one day, she showed up, and there was no dot. Well, in that culture, if a, if, if a woman did not wear a red dot on her forehead, it can only mean that she was a widow. So he went up to his teacher and he began to express concern. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to hear about, see about your husband. She said, what are you talking about? His name was Syed. She said, Syed, cool down here. Said, My husband's fine. Well, well, you're not wearing a red dot today. Oh, she said, Syed, Syed. She said, I'm no longer a Hindu. I have become a follower of Jesus Christ. I am today a child of God. I'm a lover of Jesus Christ. He has saved me. She, she goes on and she says, he has saved me. He has washed me. She uses these words. He's lifted me out of the miry clay. And I know that when this life is over, I'm going to be with him in heaven forever. He was just, Syed was astounded. He was about a sophomore in high school. He was perplexed and then he got angry. He said, you can't worship. Notice what the issue is. You can't worship Jesus. Jesus is just a prophet. Jesus isn't God. What are you doing? This is, this is, he gets excited. He starts saying, this is blasphemy. This is sacrilege. How can you do this? How can you worship a man? She says, settle down, Syed. She said, I want to talk to you. She said, I don't expect you to understand what I'm going through. But someday I pray that you will. And, I pr and then she goes on and she says, I'm praying for you that God will speak to your heart about Jesus as he has spoken to my heart about Jesus too. Syed so says he left that class. He was just devastated. He was so upset. He didn't know what to do. But he didn't forget that. He didn't forget that. And she said, I'm praying for you. That prayer in Syed's life began to be answered two years later. He was now a senior in high school, and uh, his family was going through trouble. His parents weren't getting along. His father was a, a, a harsh, angry man, sometimes beating his mother, often using bad language on her, and threatening her, and always lately talking a lot about divorce, divorce, divorce. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to divorce you. So Syed left the house. It was, a, it was winter. It was actually Christmas Eve. And he went to a park, and he sat alone. Notice what Paul says here. Let me come back to the scriptures here. Verse 9, he says, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, salvation is always of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. He's in this park, and he begins to think about taking his life. He's very discouraged. 
He loves his father and mother, doesn't want to see them divorced. He doesn't want to have, have his home break up, and he doesn't know what to do, so he begins to think about taking his life. And uh, he hears a voice from behind him, and the voice says to him, Try me. I am Jesus. That became the title of the book that he's written about his life. Try me. I am Jesus. He heard the voice three times. And he had these other voices in his head, just ignore this, you're making this up. What could he do? And he thought about his teacher from two years before, telling how she had come and become a child of Christ and loved him and how she was praying for him. Her prayer was being answered that night. It was Christmas Eve, and he showed up at her door about 10.30 in the evening. <laughs> what would you do? What would you do? <laughs> he goes and he realizes that there's a party. Her house is full of people. He rings the doorbell, and she comes and opens, opens the door. Syed, come in, come in. Oh, nice to see you. They make some small talk, and then she said, okay, Syed. She says, quit beating around the bush here. <laughs> what are you doing on my doorstep just, about, just before midnight on Christmas Eve? What, what's going on here? What's happened? And he unfolds his story. He bears his soul. She said, Syed, God is speaking to you. That was God's voice you heard today. It's an answer to prayer. And she said, Come to church with me. It's Christmas, Christmas morning. Just about come to, come to church with us in the morning. And he agreed to do that. And there he heard the gospel of God's love for him. You know, this gospel doesn't come to us because we deserve it. It comes to us out of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ because you and I desperately Needed. I, I want to interrupt the story by Syed for a moment. I want to, I want to tell you a, a story from one of Tim Keller's books. He wrote a book called Every Good Endeavor, and it's about the gospel at work, in the workplace. And he tells a story of uh, pastoring a church in Manhattan, young church, growing church. And uh, he noticed a young woman would come in just as... This, just as the service was beginning, and then she would leave just as the service was ending. He couldn't, couldn't meet her, and he, de he decided, one day I'm going to beat her to the door. <laughs> I'm going to meet this woman and find out what's going on. Here's the story he heard. She was a single mom. She was new to Manhattan. She had a child, and she, uh, she was grateful for the job. She had, she had a, w a good paying job, uh, but something happened at work. And she made a big mistake. And she was about to lose her job. And uh, for some reason that she could never, well, can't understand, her boss went to bat for her. And her boss said to his boss, look, this woman needs this job. Um, but whatever wrong she's done, whatever harm she's brought upon the company, let that, let that be a, a, a counted to my account. Just put that on me. She needs, she needs this job. So the boss said, you know, this is going to cost you with a company. You know that, don't you? He said, yeah, it's okay. He said, it's all right. I'll, I'll take it. So she kept her job. <laughs> One day, not too long after that, knocked on his office door. May I come in? Yes. She sits down and she says, I have to know, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Oh, she, he said, he tried to blow it. He said, it was nothing. He said, don't worry about it. No, he, she said, uh-uh. She said, this is, this is more than nothing. And she said, he, she persisted, I want to know why you did this. He paused and he lowered his voice and he said to her, I am a Christian. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross for me. 
And he took every wrong thing I'd ever done and every would, every would do. He took that all on himself. And he paid the price for all of the wrong I have ever done. And I'm so grateful that he did that, that I purposed that if I ever had the opportunity to take that upon myself or someone else, that I would do it. And she said, I've often had bosses take credit for the good things I've done. That happens all the time, doesn't it? She said, I've never had a boss take credit for the bad things I've done. And then she just looked at him. He, sa he says, as the story goes, there was 10 or 15 seconds of silence. They just sat there. And finally she said, what church do you go to? She wanted to know. And it was Tim Keller's church. She started coming to church and she came to Christ. She came to know the Lord as her Savior. Great story. He calls us to a holy calling. Well, the, the next thing he says about the gospel is in verse 10 here, that, that Christ, that God abolished death and uh, says that uh, we find this in verse 10, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of the Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death. Now, the word abolished doesn't mean that nobody ever dies again. It means that he rendered death to be inoperative, ineffective. People die, but that death doesn't separate them from God if they trust in Christ. And so Jesus rose from the grave, and so we also will raise, be raised from the grave. The appearing of our Savior, verse 10, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which, Paul says, I was appointed a preacher an apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed. So, God abolished death through Christ. That's why Paul could say to the Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It is far better, he says. Jesus said in John 11, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. So for the one who is trusting in Christ, our last breath on earth becomes our first breath in heaven. God gave us. So not only did God abolish death, but fourthly, God gave us eternal life in his presence, this new life begins today. We are a new creation in Christ. Paul says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We are a new creation in Christ. That new life begins today. And now, our job, our job is to share the gospel with people. Paul says, I become a, a, a preacher, an apostle. I share the gospel. I preach the message and that's why I suffer. I want to come back to the story about Syed for just a moment or two. All through the years, um, uh, Syed would, he went, he went to school, he went to uh, Bible college and would later pastor a church, but when he was at Bible college, he... Uh, he, he, the, the word was out that he was a believer in Christ, but he had never talked about it openly. And then one day at lunch, he had about 10 fellow college students, and, and uh, he thought, this is my opportunity. And so he said, you may have heard some things about me. I want you to know I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe in him. And and they sat and they listened, and he talked and he talked and he shared the gospel with them. And he thought, he thought, I'm so, he, he was relieved to be able to talk to them face to face about it. He thought, 
oh, this is going so well, you know, but it wasn't very long before he realized how angry they were becoming. Very angry. And um, a few of them just stood up in disgust and walked out. Others had veins bulging in their neck, fists that were clenched, and he had no idea what he was in for. And some of them stood up and began to beat on him. He said, I, I knew it would be bad, he said. He thought it would be bad, but he said, I, I didn't know how bad. So he said, one day, not long after that, he said his, his classmates grabbed him, took him by one leg, and there was a mosque on campus, and he said, they dragged me, one of my legs up in there, they dragged him to the mosque. And he said, when we were just at the doorway of the mosque, he said, they began to kick me in the gut. Now try this on for a picture. My friends then kicked me in the gut and left me there while they went inside and performed their prayers. Is that a picture? Yeah. It's a picture of false religion, isn't it? Yeah. And so he, he tells how after he graduated from Bible college, he, he uh, began to pastor a church. And uh, he, would, he would always invite his mother to come to, to church services. And uh, she would never come. But he kept it up. He thought, you know, someday she's going to say yes. And, and there came a day when his mother did say yes. And uh, she said, I have to tell you, I'm not going to stay for the whole service. I don't want to meet anybody. I'll, just look, I'll be there for part of it, and then I'm leaving. He thought, I'll take it. Gone. So this was the morning she came, and uh, he said she came in about a half an hour late, and uh, she sat way in the back in the corner to try to be unnoticed by anyone. And he had prepared, he just he felt the Lord had given him a very special message that day. And the message was about God's care and provision of the Israelites after they were called out of Egypt. And he talked about how God provided a pillar of fire to guide them and protect them by day, by night. And, uh, and then how God had used fire in the ministry of Elijah, calling down fire from heaven on the, 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 the sacrifice and, and uh, to defeat the prophets of Baal and how God had used fire to protect his people. He, he talked about that. And um, his mother didn't leave. She didn't leave the service. And uh, at the end of this, the message, he said, here was his invitation. If anyone here wants this kind of protection in your life, all you need is Jesus. He not only redeemed us from sin, but also from all the powers of the evil one. Then he, he writes these words. As I invited people to come speak with me about following Jesus, the first person to come toward me was my mother. He said I was flabbergasted. I thought surely she has not understood what I've asked them to do. <laughs> um, she knelt down at the front of the church with tears streaming down her cheeks. He said I could not believe my eyes. I thought perhaps she had misunderstood, misunderstood some part of what I had said, so I bent down and I said, Mom, did you understand my question? I asked only those people who wanted to follow Jesus to come to the front. <laughs> Can you imagine? She said, yes, I understood perfectly, and yes, I want to follow Jesus. So I joyfully read her, led her in a prayer to accept the Lord. And so, so he said, after we got back home, I said, Mom, what was that all about this morning? What happened? What happened to you? And, uh, and uh, she said, she told him the story behind what happened that morning. Here's the story. He said, it really began just not long after you made a decision to follow Jesus. And everybody in the family was upset. Your uncles were, were going crazy and 
and there was a lot of people telling me, I've got to talk you out of this. I've got to pull you back from this. He, he can't follow Jesus. He's, he's offending the prophet. He's, a, he's blaspheming against God. So there's a lot of pressure. And so she said, I, I decided to try to do something very extreme. She said, um, I went to a woman who practiced black magic. And then he explains in Islam, black magic is very strong. It's some of the strongest magic on the face of the earth, he said. And so she knew of this woman. He took, she took some, a lock of his hair, took an article of clothing, took, a, took a, some money to pay, to pay the witch, and then uh, wrote his name on a piece of paper. Took those all to the woman. And she explained what she needed. She needed a curse put on her son so that he would abandon following Jesus and he would come back to Islam. Oh, she said that. This won't be hard. Just very, you know, you know how everybody knows just what to do. She said this would not be a difficult thing to do. So she went and she locked herself in a room to perform the black magic. After, and here's, what, here's what he writes. After a while, the woman ran out of the room. These are his, his mother's words, telling the story. Returned everything to, to my mother, including the money and the paper on which my name was written. And she said, please get out of here at once. My mother was stunned, he writes and could see that the woman was literally shaking from head to foot. My mother asked her, what, what's the matter? What's going on here? And she refused to answer and just repeated her previous command, get out of here, just leave me. And my mother insisted that she know what had happened. Then the woman, the witch, explained this. As I performed the necessary magic, I saw that your son, Syed, was surrounded by a great wall of fire, more powerful than anything I have ever seen in all my life. And this wall of fire was shielding him. And as I sent my powerful spirits toward your son, they burned up. I have lost some of my powers today because of your son. The fire surrounding your son is very holy and very powerful. None of my spirits could go near it. This kind of protection can only come from a God greater than the one I serve. It is better that you leave here as soon as possible because I'm afraid that I will lose all of my powers, have nothing to make my living with. Moreover, it's wiser to leave your son alone and not to do anything against him. He has great protection around him. And no power of any kind or any kind of magic can ever penetrate that protection. My mother was astounded, and it took her years to try to understand what had happened. She would talk to people. She would ask about it, different people. You know, could this happen? And, you know, how about this? And, and nobody could ever give her an explanation. So that this story remained in her mind all these years. And as he talked about fire that morning, God opened her eyes to the truth. She said... Today, as you were speaking about the fire, it was as if I could literally see the fire around every person in the church. I now understand that the fire was protection you had through Jesus Christ. I, too, wanted this protection. This is the reason I have now committed my life to follow Jesus. He said, I remembered God's promise from Numbers 23, 23 that says, there is no sorcery against Jacob, no, no divination against Israel. It will now be said of Jacob and Israel, see what God has done. Well, we were all thrilled that, that God showed himself mighty and that his works, uh, that he works in ways that we cannot see or comprehend. His ways are higher than ours and his purposes are loftier than our, our, our best intentions. When the Lord allows us to go through certain circumstances, we might not be able to see it, but he is there. He's working out his perfect will for the glory of his matchless name and for the extension of his divine kingdom. I had the honor of baptizing my mother in that same church a month later. 
She is now a strong follower of Jesus and an active member of the church. And then he summarizes this. He says, God is always active. God is always working. He loves us. And that doesn't change. God is always working on our behalf. And he's he's in control of every situation, all of our diseases, all of our afflictions, all of our persecutions, all of our heartaches, and all of our tears, his word says. And we know that in all things, God works together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. This morning, I would like to invite you, if you haven't ever committed your life to Jesus Christ, to pause before him and ask if if this is the kind of protection you need in your life, if this is the kind of direction you want your life to take, a direction not of the world, not of self and sin, but a direction of serving and pleasing and honoring God with your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.